Welcome everybody to Sustainable River Basin Management Part 3 of Module 2.2. Today we will be speaking about land use and river restoration and ecosystem services. Let's first of all look into uh, what we, uh, why river restoration may become important. Uh, we last time talked about equilibrium uh, river systems and uh, steady state river systems and uh, natural processes shaped or overshaped by human or, or wildlife or, or floral impacts. And this time we will be using the term unstable rivers and talk about this. What we mean by an unstable river is something like this, where the river banks are um, breaking away, where there are uh, slumps taking place, where um, rivers are eroding in a way that would not be uh, um, the natural uh, erosion profile in, in, a, in a certain region. That erosion can take place uh, and affect uh, house, housing construction, roads, and uh, other uh, urban systems, for instance, or may eat away very fertile land uh, that was important for agriculture. Now, <coughs> what is problematic about this is that um, the water quality uh, is negatively influenced. We lose habitat, we, we um, destroy or change floodplain functions. Uh, due to unstable rivers, we cause land degradation and uh, we also change water availability. What causes such uh, unstable rivers? And we can see a, an example here where the local uh, level is he high here and in very recent times uh, a lot of uh, erosion has taken place and formed such a, a steep uh, river bank within a very short time. Uh, the causes of this could be an increased inflow. We can speculate about where this inflow comes from. It could be an increased runoff. Again, we will talk about it a little bit later. It can uh, be the result of a change in sediment loads. It could be the result of in-stream modifications. It could also be the result of a changed riparian buffer. Now, let's look into uh, the impact of increased slopes and hydraulic gradients. And I'm not only uh, using the term slope here, but also hydraulic gradient uh, uh, reminding us to the fact that surface water and groundwater are connected and changing groundwater levels means changing hydraulic gradients which have a direct impact on what happens on our surface. So um, floodplains may uh, be drained faster for instance or uh, areas which used to be dry may become wetlands due to uh, changes in hydraulic gradients. Now, <clears throat> what the uh, very generic model is, which, from which you can depart and analyze any other system, we have uh, two stages. And uh, in this case, the first stage, a river uh, draining into the ocean, reaching the base level, it, it's meandering through a flat plane. The second stage would be uh, if we would lower the water level in our reservoir here, that we increase, uh, we create a gradient here, we increase slopes, and by that we increase um, head erosion. Head erosion is taking place and moving uh, upstream, the river erodes into the floodplain and we form a new floodplain here and we have an old floodplain here. 
And then we may see uh, waterfalls here, or we may have, uh, or what we certainly have is an additional nick point here. So this is simply the result of uh, reducing that base level here. And as it progresses, this uh, newly formed floodplain becomes more established, and our, we develop an own watershed here, with, which increases the catchment uh, of this part of the river here. So just a minor, uh, appearing minor change in slope here, um, in, in change in base level has, can explain many of the um, river system features that we observe in, in our uh, real life. It, the situation may be sometimes more complex, but the model actually is quite applicable to most of the situations. Um, what are the causes of these increased slopes? Uh, they can be caused by our intervention. It could be because we, we channelize, we straighten our rivers. It could be because we are dredging rivers. Why do we dredge? We may want to make uh, ships, uh, allow ships to pass through uh, uh, our river systems to reach far inland to transport goods. Or it would be, would, could be the result of tectonic events. But it could also be the result of a dam break. It could also be the result of the uh, lowering of a reservoir surface. So we low, lower our local base level. We lower our, uh, we increase our local flow velocity. Uh, all of those increase a slope and increase um, the instability of a river system. Um, let's look into examples of such um, uh, change in dynamics and uh, the results of uh, channelization. We have, I've chosen here the example of the Danube River in Europe. It's one of the major rivers, it's the major river system in, in Western Europe. Um, and it has been there have been trials to tame that river for over centuries, which were mostly not lasting long. In one year, it's the next um, uh, rainy, uh, 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 rainy season or flood season, all these uh, effects of building bridges and uh, connecting uh, islands were undone. Um, it was possible to uh, use old maps going back to the uh, 16th century and, and to reestablish what the river system looked like at that time uh, in the area of today's Vienna, the city, large city of Vienna, um, and the river system in the late 18th century. What you can see here is that this all before the major changes, major uh, lasting engineering uh, were achieved. What you can see is that the main, there was one main channel here and several smaller ones and which drained most of the water and some um, temporary active, probably at high flow, appears uh, active channels uh, somewhere here. And this changed completely over these uh, 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 few hundred years and this formerly active channel became an abandoned an, uh, an oxbow and the main channel moved, shifted uh, to this uh, uh, south uh, uh, northward area. Um, probably this has been going on for as long as the river existed. Uh, what the result is of today's engineering or the last um, centuries, uh, two centuries of engineering is a straight river looking almost like a road, like a highway, and it has become a highway for the transport of goods and people uh, through the city, city area, and some 
leftovers for uh, probably also some uh, land use purposes uh, in in this part here. So it has nothing else to do anymore with what the system used to be in, in the past. Now this has come along with a lot of costs. It has improved for shipping of, uh, and transportation. Uh, also the usage of this land more could be urbanized uh, or used for agricultural purposes. However, um, because it, the canal was straightened, flow velocities increased, channel erosion increased, um, and uh, such uh, fast moving systems are less able to cope with high flow events, with flood events, which then still breaks those banks and floods uh, now urbanized areas. So for that reason, and for uh, the health of the system itself, the aquatic life, the water quality issues, uh, a lot of uh, renaturation of rehabilitation is taking place to reintroduce or reconnect some of these older um, existing um, channels of the Danube to the main channel again. We have other examples which look similar, extreme, uh, in, of Europe, the Rhine River is one of the major examples where the Rhine, uh, uh, the river bed actually has eroded to about about six meter below the former surface, which shows the impact of uh, increasing straightening a river and increasing the flow velocity in such an area. And again, uh, due to floods and uh, water quality issues. Um, large uh, efforts go now into reconnecting the main canal to some of these former former uh, streams. Now, uh, land use change usually come along with the change in sediment load, which again also is a very important uh, component besides the, the slopes and the velocities. Just examples how we shape our landscape and in that we change uh, flow in a river. We may have an extreme like this where rice production is taking place and water has been taking, taken out of uh, a stream or several streams and been uh, cascaded across this landscape here been used for rice production and eventually reaching the bottom and maybe joining another stream or the same stream again downstream. And we have one more example here of how land use in an extreme part changes um, the river system and sediment load. This is uh, mining taking place. Those are people here and you see how the entire river has river um, channel has been changed due to the removal of the riparian vegetation but also the movement of sediments from one side uh, from one area to another area where digging is taking place and washing is taking place and with the next uh, major rainfall event all of these sediments will be moved again and deposited somewhere uh, downstream and by that change uh, local gradients. So agriculture are, uh, are major uh, factors, artisanal mining in this case for instance, uh, major deforestation and urbanization uh, have a major impact on sediment laws. All of them essentially work on bank erosion uh, the impoundment of, of sediment loads. Now, um, another factor on land use change is that we change our flow connectivity, our stream flow patterns. You've seen those uh, in the examples of the channelization of streams, but urbanization and especially the 
stormwater management in our uh, urban areas have a major impact on these flow connectivities. Just an example of uh, a peri-urban interface where we have a flat plain here, then we have some uh, 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 canal which is, is constructed to drain water from, from this urban area um, some, to somewhere else to move this water, remove it fast from this area. And then we have housing right next to this uh, very wet or wetland or floodplain area here. Um, and such urban areas have the tendency to expand and go beyond those uh, limits, those sharp boundaries probably will only be very short-lived and uh, very soon this part also will be uh, a construction area and become urbanized. And that we, have, we change our river systems severely and irreversibly. Another example is um, where several rivers meet. This is um, a town in, in Germany as an example. I could have picked any other similar example. It's Passau in the south, um, called the city of three rivers. This is where three rivers meet. And uh, because of the land uses in the upstream areas, we nowadays uh, often observe uh, situations where flood peaks occur, flash floods occur, and uh, major um, disasters take place when those peaks meet uh, at the point where those rivers join. So um, this is a major um, management issue, which also has taken is one of the reasons why uh, river restoration has become so important. Now, what are the techniques to stabilize um, a river? And there are traditional engineering fields dealing with uh, this. We used to uh, apply channel armoring. We aligning our systems so that uh, water cannot uh, infiltrate into the soil or not leave the canal. Uh, we use culverts and the usual picture of an urban uh, environment with a river is would be something like this. Um, again, I could have picked any other picture for that, showing how rivers are somewhere uh, built completely taken over river systems, drainage systems are completely, have completely disappeared and uh, taken over by the urban needs of, of this region. And how rivers in detail would be in many cases look like in, in our cities, in our urban areas, uh, we may have some space for, to walk along here or to some cycle, cycling tracks and so on. We may enjoy this uh, when there's water, but um, it is uh, very artificial and not uh, really connecting to a, a river system. It's efficiently channeling water from, from one end to another end uh, without taking into consideration here the usefulness of this water maybe in this very location. So all of these traditional engineering, besides these uh, aspects which I mentioned already, have shown very limited success. And this is because uh, the, the major events cannot be uh, curbed with these engineering solutions. Uh, an example is here. This has been a lined, lined river system. And once a major uh, large magnitude event comes, um, all of this uh, has been washed away uh, like toys. And another example is here, uh, an experience from the Elbe River in, in uh, Middle Europe. Again, a major uh, flood event, uh, several flood events in recent years. Uh, the last major event was in 2006. And this particular area is the city of Dresden. It's a 
large, large urban area here where the Elbe River was lined uh, and is lined and with the um, flood event um, the Elbe River actually reclaimed old former river channels and they became active and very uh, predominant. The effect was, for instance, that uh, one of the river, arms of the river are uh, underneath the today's railway station. That railway station got washed out. It's a major railway station in this in the city. So whatever we do, and we, we may be able to tame under uh, low flow and moderate flow conditions will be in many cases uh, completely undone under large uh, events. Uh, let's look into stream evolution and uh, there are typical pathways to that. Um, just taking, taking one, one of the examples um, of how the critical height and the base level height uh, play together and form different uh, valley shapes and sedimentation and erosion processes, erosion taking place laterally, um, taking place along the channel or deepening a channel or co a combination of all uh, some collapse taking place and the formation of uh, alluvial uh, floodplains uh, with old terraces and uh, active terraces and so on. So this is a typical pathway and we can see in which part our particular river system is uh, uh, right now in this moment. However, all of these are irreversible processes. We cannot uh, revert this um, by engineering uh, applications. So this, this could be a natural uh, evolution, as one would expect. But it could also be initiated by some unwanted processes or some um, human intervention that was initially wanted but uh, then ran out of control and became uh, something unwanted. Uh, still, those effects cannot be restored. We can only partially then recover maybe riverbanks or change the depths of uh, uh, a river valley. But essentially, it's an in irreversible process. So it becomes very expensive and usually not very successful. Now, uh, because of all this, there are new approaches to stabilize rivers. And uh, we've mentioned the term before, the restoration, river restoration. Uh, what restoration in the strict uh, uh, context means is to return the stream to its original pre-development condition. That's a very uh, ambitious uh, aim in most of the cases. Um, more appropriate is the term river rehabilitation, which means that we are trying to stabilize or to fix some of the aspects in a degraded stream to restore it to, to bring it back to some uh, close to some original condition. And then the last term that we usually use is remediation, which means that we, we acknowledge that um, we cannot restore the river. We cannot uh, change the river back to uh, an original condition uh, because it's not relevant anymore, it's simply not possible, it's maybe politically also not possible. Um, and by intervening here, we simply create completely new uh, conditions in the river which may become better, it may be become a healthy system again. Now, <coughs> um, this figure here shows this uh, relationship. We have here the ecosystem structure, which uh, could be measured in species richness. And we have here our ecosystem function, uh, which could be uh, measured in, in biomass. 
And then what we can say that uh, our original ecosystem, this was before we degraded or changed it, before a dam was built, for instance, uh, it must have been a system that was probably in the specific uh, climate condition, the specific situation where it occurs, uh, rich in species, high biodiversity, uh, uh, functioning ecosystem structures and um, functioning ecosystem uh, 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 services. And then as we have been using it, abusing it, we have degraded the ecosystem to a very low level, very poor in species richness compared to what would be normal for or typical for, for such a system, untouched system. And with um, uh, remediation, we would try to achieve something like that would be positioned here. It would be a new ecosystem, and we would expect it to be uh, serving all of the ecosystem functions. We may we are not able to restore species richness in any way. Uh, there may be trials to reintroduce species, but all of those trials have. Uh, there are lots of examples of that have badly failed because we don't understand the complexity of those um, interplays and connections of, of species. Now, we can say that what we want to achieve is uh, uh, a good ecosystem health. We want a system that is rich in biodiversity. We want a system that is rich in, in or functioning as such. Um, very difficult questions are usually what is our baseline. We need a, uh, a baseline to be able to I classify something as a degraded system or to be able to say we want to remediate or we want to rehabilitate or restore to this and that level. What is our baseline for that? Usually a very difficult to answer also the question of uh, which target we want to achieve. Probably we can, uh, from a scientific point of view, we may uh, aim at something like this, but from an economical or political or some other uh, real uh, limiting points of view, this may never be possible. Um, we may have to compromise to something like this. So, <clears throat> and over what time period we want to achieve such a, uh, a target. So those are very difficult questions. Uh, in many cases, we, uh, we ourselves have created uh, wetlands or impoundments and which over the centuries have stabilized in itself and have become very important in our lives and important as, as ecosystems. So very often it becomes uh, a question of values and uh, of uh, cultural uh, conditions of the so society pulling for or against some of this. So not in all of the cases it's very obvious that it's a toxic river, it's completely degraded and something has to be done and action will be coming out of something like this. Now. Let's conclude on river system health and on this module. Uh, the first rule of rehabilitation is, and I'm quoting here because this is, um, it says it all. The first rule of rehabilitation is to avoid the damage in the first place. Uh, we can state that it's easy, quick and cheap to damage natural streams. And on the other hand, it is very hard slow and expensive to return um, what has been damaged to an original state. It's in many cases uh, simply impossible. We usually are not capable to return the system uh, or come anywhere close to the complexity of a natural system. And for that reason, the highest priorities should not be in rehabilitating streams, and putting our efforts into becoming good in this, but to avoid damages, especially of those river systems which are currently in good conditions. This has been coming from this uh, uh, 
group of authors and uh, you should try to get hold of that publication yourself as well. Thank you and I'll see you next time again.